Welcome to ADAP Prevention 365 Hot Topic Podcast. Today is Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. I am Jeannie Shimatsu, Community Prevention Coordinator of the Asian American Drug Abuse Program, ADAP Inc., and your host today. Our Hot Topic Podcast is an ADAP prevention series designed to engage discussion on current issues as it relates to substance abuse prevention. Each year on December 1st, we dedicate, it, we dedicate time to reflect upon our global response to the HIV AIDS epidemic. Through keeping the memory of millions of lives lost over the past decades, and more importantly, celebrating the movement and achievements to create and innovate action. This year's theme is ending the HIV AIDS epidemic, resilience and impact. I am excited and honored to introduce our special guest, Robert Gamboa. Robert Gamboa currently works in the public policy department for the Los Angeles LGBT Center, the world's largest service provider for the LGBTQ plus community. Together with his team, they work on immigration education, homelessness, food insecurity, civil rights, racial, racial justice, anti-violence, anti-poverty, health equity, youth seniors, and so much more. Mr. Gamboa is an appointed city official serving on the Lesbian and Gay Advisory Board, LGAB, for the city of West Hollywood since 2012. Serving as the chair three times, um, the Lesbian and Gay Advisory Board assists the West Hollywood City Council on issues such as substance abuse, discrimination, equality, racial justice and inclusion, and any pressing matters for the city concerning the LGBTQ community. Mr. Gambo earned his Bachelor's of Business Administration from the University of Texas at Austin and recently graduated with his master's degree in public policy from UCLA's Liskin School of Public Affairs. Welcome, Robert. Welcome. You and I go back many years to the County Coalition RAM or, rethink, or Rethinking Access to Marijuana. And more recently through Facebook, as I have learned, you have a second career in stand-up comedy. <laughs> <laughs> but we are, on a, we are on a really important topic on World's AIDS Day. And I really want to thank you for coming because I feel like there's so much that you could share and give uh, to you know, our audience and to people out there that may need resources um, about the issues that you'll cover. So if I may start with a question about World AIDS Day, why is this, why is World AIDS Day personal for you? Um, well, thank you for that intro and thank you for having me. And um, yes, we do go back quite a, quite a <laughs> several years. So it's been a, certainly a pleasure to be here and to, um, to, well, to, to participate in this event. Um, and I have been enjoying my second career as stand-up comedy. <laughs> I'm just trying to shine some light on this really crazy time, you know, some fun. Um, so World AIDS Day, um, obviously it was meant to commemorate and memorialize all the people that we've lost to AIDS since the epidemic began. And for, <clears throat> Uh, many of us, and especially me, we've lost so many loved ones. Um, my twin brother passed away from AIDS in 2012, and that was, um, you yeah, know, it was and still is a very daunting experience, right? Um, and on top of that, me and my own experience with um, HIV and substance abuse, um, I have been HIV positive since um, 2007. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I've been uh, this weekend, I will be sober 11 years. But prior to that, um, I had a very long period of substance abuse. Um, and through, through my own journey, um, I've seen a lot of death and I've seen a lot of suffering. Um, and that is what really uh, getting sober um, and beginning my journey of sobriety is what really set me on this path 
to working for our communities, our communities that are struggling with substance abuse, HIV, homelessness, um, post-incarceration, like all of these types of um, experiences that are uh, compounded with more and more challenges. So, um, so at the intersection of all of this is policies that can make it easier for people who are struggling to find a better way out. Um, and that, that is where I, I jumped in. And, you know, I think a lot of people feel like AIDS is over. Um, I think people think that, um, you know, it's, it's, it, we've kind of moved on from it. It's we're 30, 35 years approximately into this epidemic. And we, um, you know, there's not a cure. Um, we do have medications and treatments that uh, prevent it and make our lives manageable and livable. Um, and, you know, very grateful for that, but it took a long time for us to get there. And I think it's important that, um, that we not only continue to recognize um, and memorialize the people that we've lost, but the people that are surviving the AIDS epidemic, um, the work that was done in order to get us to this point. So um, the, um, like the treatment action groups and uh, the silence equals death movement and all of the activists who really pushed for medications and to fighting against the government and the stigma and everything that happened um, to get us to this point where we can have a livable life. You know, you mentioned something earlier as we were discussing, uh, you know, we learn a lot from history and we learn a lot through challenges and especially this past year, you know, you're dealing all the things you listed, you listed uh, the lifestyle and substance abuse and all of that culminates. And now we have COVID, now we have COVID. So based on what we've learned from the AIDS epidemic, what is it that we could be utilizing now in response to COVID with these lessons? You know, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. You know, I've, I've, as soon as COVID uh, hit, a lot of um, people were saying, you know, don't compare the two epidemics because they're not the same. Um, and then you have some people who um, are saying, hey, let's, let's do compare what we've learned, right? So, so, you know, some of the things, there's a lot of stark differences. So it's hard to like, definitely we're comparing apples and oranges. But um, when, when the AIDS epidemic first hit, um, we, we knew very little of it. And that's kind of what we're in the situation now with COVID is like, we don't, we don't know the science and the biology behind these diseases yet. We're starting to learn. It took us years before we were finally able to get a sustainable treatment for HIV. Um, and here we are eight months into the COVID pandemic and we're trying to, uh, we're, we just now have three pharmaceutical companies that are finding some promising vaccine results, right? Um, and by the way, there's no mention of cure because it's just, that's probably not possible, right? At least not at this time. So when one of the biggest challenges is when the AIDS epidemic first hit in the early 80s was there was so much stigma and so much shame. Um, and the not only did the society push people who were HIV positive or AIDS, in fact, it was called GRID, the gay, the gay, um, the gay disease, right? So um, religion and society were pushing entire populations into the dark, right? We don't want to see you you're bad people. There's policies even being made around that. Um, and if you remember Ronald Reagan and his, uh, and his staff just laughed it off. Um, and that was one of the first things we should have paid attention to is that, you know, the lack of a coordinated government response, a federal coordinated government response. Um, and here we have a very similar situation in 2020 with the lack of a coordinated federal response to another epidemic. Now, since HIV has hit the United States, we've, we've uh, lost around 700,000 people to AIDS, right? Already in eight months of COVID, we've lost over 250,000. So you can see that, you know, COVID is so much more 
it's so much easier transmiss transmissible transmitted <laughs> uh you know be through just breathing through touching through fluids through a, a number of different mechanisms and so it affects everybody imagine if covid had only been like affecting a certain subpopulation right um the the, the response the resources the that we've had thus far um, would not have been the same, right? So I think that's one thing that we did definitely learn is that why, that why, why we don't have a full federal um, coordinated response, we do have a lot of local responses. Now they're all different. <laughs> they're different in each state in each county and even in each city um, and even from agency to agency. So, um, you know, there's, and then society of course is, um, we don't understand this science because we just don't have it, right? So are masks working? How do we prevent it? Are we supposed to, is social distancing really working? Are, are you know, all these questions are happening. Um, and we, you know, we're just trying to figure out our best, right? We're putting out all these feelers, trying to understand um, just how far, uh, just, just how much we can try and prevent the spread. Um, and I think that is, um, I, I like that the, that we at least did have a COVID a couple of COVID packages past the federal government, um, and I think that was very helpful. I wish we had had this level of response even back for the HIV epidemic, because you you know imagine how much more how many less people would have died if we'd have had this concentrated of an effort. Um, it sounds like I'm, I'm I'm trying to balance it, but I, I wish that we'd had this level of response, but I still wish we would have had a, still currently have more of a response, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so uh, I think we're just trying to understand it. Um, and one of those challenges I think that we're experiencing is um, it's, it's kind of a balance between economic stability and human life. Um, and I, you know, I hear that in all of these city council, commission, state government meetings is how are we going to maintain ourselves and keep ourselves sustainable with tax revenues coming in, but at the same time preserve human life. Um, and, and I feel like that maybe is one of the biggest lessons we've learned since the AIDS epidemic is that we've been able to even have that question on a government table and you know, to, to discuss, I think is a big move. Um, we, it was unfortunate that the Trump administration um, disbanded President Obama's um, uh, a committee to, to manage uh, pandemics. Um, and I think had that been in place, had we been able to do um, a little bit more, I think we would have had a, we've been able to answer that question a little bit easier um, and make local governments and state governments um, have an, and, and local health departments a little bit easier to manage the situation. Um, I think that answers your question, right? Well, it did actually very much so. And what's interesting is what, you, what was echoed in the, um, in the 1980s in many ways is, is being echoed now. It's not issues, particularly issues with the LGBTQ community, community uh, in the past four years, uh, policy-wise, have been on the reversal. So that, in many ways, have, has had to have this overlapping effect by not being recognized as 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 a group, as people. Yeah. Then that that has the domino effect of if we are not recognized as a group, how are you recognizing the subsequent issues that are facing our population? So um, I, I think in tying that in uh, HIV and substance abuse, because these are such heavy hitting issues, do you still see, or what do you see, do you see that as a, a high level of concern, of continued concern now for the LGBTQ community when you're looking at addressing the resource and the needs to the issues of HIV and substance abuse? Yeah, um, it's interesting. Like, I want to say yes, everything is skyrocketing across the board. I'll just say that up ahead. But 
I don't have numbers to back it up. <laughs> so it's really observational. And the reason why I don't have enough statistical evidence to say that, you know, skyrocket, uh, substance abuse is skyrocketing or STDs or HIV rates are skyrocketing is because right out of the gates, when COVID first hit, a lot of the public health labs, a lot of the um, testing was redirected for COVID testing and only COVID testing. So unless you had health insurance or um, some private medical practice or whatever, um, all of the public testing was, or for at least for in the immediate um, onset of COVID was redirected to COVID. So we didn't have initial testing numbers. And then everyone stayed home, right? Because especially in places like LA County, we had the stay at home orders. A lot of people were afraid when, you know, I think it was March 13th was like the, the big date when everything kind of shut down. And I still get goosebumps thinking that I did because it was such a momentous moment in our, in our experience, like all of a sudden the world shut down like that. And so most people stayed home unless they were a first responder or a, a food service person. And uh, so we weren't conducting tests and people weren't getting treated or people were not even uh, identifying if they were getting any kind of STD or, or whatever the case was. So, um, so in this chaotic moment, when people are at home, social isolation, mental health issues, um, suicidal ideations, uh, people losing their jobs, economic insecurity. And right now with eviction moratoriums in place, we don't necessarily have an increase in homelessness, but a lot of people are still leaving their apartments because they know at some point they're not going to be able to pay that back pay, right? Their rental arrears. Um, so when you compound all of that and pretty much not very strong coping mechanisms in this, you know, in this chaotic moment of a pandemic and, you know, are we safe? Are we not safe? Can we go out? Can we not go out? I don't know what to do. So substance abuse, um, I can say just from my own experience and observations and, and, and what I do has, has skyrocketed, right? I've seen a number of men in particular, gay men who are, you know, I can't fathom being homeless and on drugs in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but yet there are numerous people who are falling into um, homelessness and because of their substance abuse and um, overdoses that they're having to fight through right in the middle of this. Um, and a lot of the treatment centers were not accepting uh, new patients or incoming clients because of that, or they had to wait, um, you know, the 14 day incubation period or whatever the case was, like we, nobody knew how to manage anything at the beginning. And to some extent, we still don't, we're, we're still trying to figure out our, our the best way. But, um, you know, we started to figure out how we can get testing done for STDs and for HIV and to get people into treatment for substance abuse um, slowly but surely. And that really was contingent upon if the agency or the county was able to figure out a way to do it because a lot of these agencies didn't have the money anymore, right? With, with everything shutting down, income streams, um, it became prohibitive for a lot of these agencies to continue testing or treatment. We just didn't have the money or the resources or the staff or staff were getting sick um, and whole departments had to shut down, right? So like this was just, it, it was this, mind-blowing moment of like how are we going to still continue to provide service provisions when when uh, we don't have the resources or capacity or funding um so slowly but surely um agencies were finding a way and i think the county health departments um were trying to figure out how to channel some of the cares act funding some of the federal funding through the state into the counties um, and ultimately to the agencies so that we can connect that right so not only get people tested but linked to treatment and to care. Um, I don't know if you saw, but just yesterday um, or yeah, um, right before Thanksgiving, <laughs> the, uh, the California Department of Public Health posted an announcement about um, untreated gonorrhea, There's, that it's spiking, right? So and this is just one of the STDs that we've been trying to monitor, which were all, situ which were all rising right before COVID even hit. Um, and if untreated gonorrhea is just one thing that we're able to see this huge spike in cases, 
Um, what does that say about HIV? What does that say about the other um, epidemics that we're all trying to find? Now, there are a lot of numbers that are now starting to come out that are proving these rising numbers of all the SDs of HIV and of substance use disorder. Um, and of course, all that comes with it, such as suicidal ideations, overdoses, mental health issues. Um, and it's only expected to get worse, right? It's only expected to get worse with um, more people losing their jobs. If you're going another lockdown, these businesses that are you know, hanging by a thread, hoping the holidays might be able to sustain them, they may not be able to make it. And those people that just got a new job as a, you know, in the service industry, especially in Los Angeles County, that's, you know, we are a primarily service industry heavy um, uh, uh, place. And so um, this, this is just gonna amount to a whole new realm of challenges, right? Are these agencies and public health departments equipped to handle this, this load of, of cases? Um, no. <laughs> uh, you know, I hate to be so blunt, but we're, you know, we're trying to do the best we can when, when we're, we're already having to convert to telehealth solutions. Um, but when someone is experiencing substance abuse and they're already isolated at home, they, uh, you know, a lot of the agencies have reduced capacity. So you definitely need an appointment way ahead of time. And you know, for the person that's experiencing substance abuse, are they able to? Are they going to be able to make it to that appointment later on that week or next week? Um, are they still going to be? Um, is their head going to be out of the fog enough for them to make it in, right? To get the treatment for whatever STD or HIV they have, or um, or whatever the case is. And in addition to that, how to overcome the fears that people have of still going out in public, right? They're still um, a lot of fear about going into a clinic or going into a medical center. Um, and how are these agencies? I, I know that some of them are, are trying to do some outside, um, you know, operations, um, especially like, you know, the flu shot and, and um, you know, COVID testing, all these things are, are happening as a drive up option. <laughs> it, we're, you know, we're finding creative ways to provide the service provisions. And I think we're going to have to continue to do that. Um, in uh, at least for the STDs and HIV and communicable diseases for substance abuse, um, that is such a tricky one. Um, what kind of messages, based on what you shared? Because yes, the reality is that there this is layered and complicated, um, and people's fear reaction, particularly their fears, uh, might act might force them into unsafe sexual practices, um, resort to substance abuse to deal with that type of stress that they're going to, whether it's uh, job economic stability, whether they have a home to go to, possibly a loss of a family member or a partner. How do you reassure them? What is it that, what messages um, do you think need to go out that need to be heard by the LGBTQ plus community that would help reassure that services aren't gone, they're still there. Might not be quite as fast, the response, but what could help reassure your community? Um, I think, you know, you kind of just said it very simply that the services are still there, right? I know people are afraid. Um, this, none of this, is any laughing matter, right? If uh, I know in the summertime, we started to relax a lot and people felt a little bit more comfortable. Other communities still felt huge weight of fear and, and didn't go out. Um, but the cases are skyrocketing, right? LA County had 6,700 new cases yesterday, I believe, right? So um, I, no, I mean, if we've lost 250,000 people, 250,000 Americans um, in eight months, and about 7,400 of those are in LA County, um, those are a lot of our friends and family members. I have, my uncle died three weeks ago from COVID, um, and I've, had, I've lost several other friends um, who have died from COVID. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's never going to get easier. Right? It's not going to get easier for us to, um, to manage some of this 
this weight, this like PTSD, this, this type of fear that's happening. But I think, you know, knowing that people are still dying and that the, the epidemic is, is still spreading um, and that we have these co-infections with other epidemics. Um, so, you know, we have this massive syndemic problem. Um, you know, I, a lot of us don't have time to grieve. Um, a lot of us don't have time to, uh, you know, we're not, we're not there in person. Like I couldn't be there for my uncle's um, family. Um, we had to stay very far apart. There were no services, no memorials. Um, no one can hug or, you know, console. And, and that makes the closure very hard, right? And it makes when you're seeing your friends and your family and community members um, die, when you're seeing your favorite restaurants um, and businesses close for good, when you're seeing community programs that you relied on every day close, there is an overwhelming sense of doom. And how do we, how do we fight through that? Well, for me, you know, like I said, I've been a long-term survivor of HIV, and I've there too. I've 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 lost my twin brother to AIDS and. Um, other friends and family. And I think um, for me personally, we're at a point where you know, sometimes we just get a little numb, right? But I know for me, like the way I have to persevere is I have to treasure those moments that I have with loved ones. Um, and I, I do that by keeping their memory alive through living a healthy life. Right, so the so a lot of the work that I do is inspired and influenced by those that I've loved and lost um, to these epidemics. Um, so, for example, you know, when my twin brother died, he is such a a, a huge advocate for uh, HIV and AIDS services in in Houston, Texas, and um, and and also for the LGBTQ community in a very red state. <laughs> Um, and he fought hard and I, you know, I picked up those pieces and I continue to raise funds for HIV and AIDS services. So it gives me something to do to honor and memorialize my brother, like doing the AIDS life cycle or doing fundraisers in California or in Texas in his name. Um, but I think for the most important thing that I can do and I, and I encourage that for all of us is that we have to live strong and live healthy right it was it is what our loved ones would want us to do i believe um because i don't want them i don't want this disease to have killed them in vain i want to fight so that the rest of us have a better chance um and we can keep their memory alive by doing so and that makes the pain a little bit less right if i'm doing something in honor of my family member then i'm then i'm cherishing them as a moment still it's like they're still here with um, and, and it makes it a little bit easier for me to have to deal with these closures or that I have to wait in line for something or that I can't get the uh, conveniences that I'm accustomed to because COVID has, has shut things down. So, um, so I have to be safe and I have to be diligent and I have to like, continue to um, reconstruct this life in a realm of safety, it's it's new. I think it's interesting. Um, you know, you hear a lot of people say, "Oh, these are unprecedented times, right? This is unprecedented," but it's not unprecedented, right? We had the HIV epidemic that taught us that what we do have to respond, that we do have to make changes in our everyday lives in order to to fight these diseases. Nature's not going to stop just because we don't like these things, right? Yeah. Nature, nature does what nature does, and these will, these little bugs will continue to evolve, and there will be a new pandemic. And you know, I, I, I hope that we have learned our lesson, not just from the AIDS epidemic and from the COVID nineteen epidemic, but for all these things, right? There's stuff happening in other other countries all the time that we just kind of turn a blind eye to because it's not happening right here in front of us. So, um, so if I can, I can learn from that, if we can learn from that, and if I can just be of service to my community, 
I'm living in the honor of my loved ones and I'm doing good for other people so that we can hopefully all live to fight another day. That's an, that's an awesome answer. It's an amazing answer and it's real. It's practical and real. And unfortunately, um, we don't want anyone else to go through this. And many who have, hopefully they hear your words and they find that there's a soul that relates to what they've gone through and that there is some hope even in the darkness. Um, I wanted to make sure that for those who do catch this podcast and are looking for resources, is there something you could share that they could access um, should they need a range of services, substance abuse, HIV testing, counseling, mental health? Yes. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, for anyone, wherever you are in California or across the country, um, you can always check first with your local public health department to find immediate resources. Um, and I know in the larger cities, there's plenty. Um, we have really great organizations in LA County, like the Los Angeles LGBT Center or APLA Health um, or ADEP or <laughs> any of, of these programs. But um, one place that I like to go to, there's just a whole list of wonderful um, resources and agencies, um, is the City of West Hollywood has a website, um, and you could just Google City of West Hollywood HIV AIDS resources, and everything's just listed there from, you know, uh, AIDS Healthcare Foundation, Project Angel Food, if you need food, substance abuse, home, you know, housing, um, testing, uh, mental health, you can find any number of resources there. You don't have to be a West Hollywood resident, obviously just LA County, but wherever you are in California or across the country, just check your local health department and they can get you started. Thank you, Robert. That's, you know, I wanna thank you for providing such honest and heartfelt uh, feedback, for sharing your story sharing information that is so needed because no matter what the stigma still needs to move away so that people can access resources and especially during this period in time where discrimination is at a new peak we want to bring empowerment back somehow even if they're in small steps so thank you so much for sharing um the sharing yourself today uh, what I want to do is for those listening and you want to get hold of Robert Gamboa, he is again the senior policy advocate and community organizer for public policy at the, uh, the L LGBT Center in Los Angeles. He could be reached at rgamboa, R-G-A-M-B-O-A at L-A-L-G-B-T-Center.org. That's rgamboa at lalgbtcenter.org and a number a phone number you could reach him is 323-860-5819 and also if you like to reach ADAP for substance abuse treatment services uh, prevention and treatment services you could reach us at www.adapinc.org and that's www.aadapinc.org uh, and you could find prevention side under community prevention. Our number is 323-293-6284. And this video, you can catch it at ADAP's YouTube channel. You'll find Handsome Robert uh, and other videos that we will have uh, under our playlist, hashtag prevention 365 hot topic. And I wanna end this with this last comment. I would like us to dedicate this, this episode to your twin brother for his fight with HIV AIDS and to your uncle who fought COVID and he's still with you. He's still with you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you.